Bienvenidos a nuestro segundo congreso de Héroes del Mantenimiento del año 2023. Antes que nada, quiero expresar nuestro más sincero agradecimiento a cada uno de ustedes por estar aquí. Sabemos el esfuerzo que implica para muchos estar acá y precisamente por eso hemos trabajado arduamente para garantizar que estos dos días de congreso estén llenos de aprendizaje y de experiencias memorables. Hoy nos encontramos en un punto crucial de la historia del mantenimiento. La tecnología avanza a pasos agigantados y con ella los retos y, por supuesto, las oportunidades que enfrentamos en nuestra labor diaria. Este congreso tiene como objetivo reunir a profesionales, a expertos, a empresas, a entusiastas del mundo del mantenimiento. Estamos aquí para aprender, para compartir experiencias y, sobre todo, para crecer juntos en este campo tan, tan esencial para el correcto funcionamiento de nuestra sociedad como es el mantenimiento. El mantenimiento no es simplemente una tarea técnica, es una disciplina que garantiza seguridad, eficiencia, sostenibilidad. Eh, para muchos puede ser un arte que combina habilidades técnicas, conocimientos teóricos y por supuesto una pasión por garantizar que todo funcione de manera óptima. Y durante estos días, eh, vamos a tener ponencias, talleres, mesas redondas, donde se abordarán eh, temas importantes, temas que hemos dividido en dos grandes áreas, el área de inteligencia artificial y el área de indicadores de gestión, donde vamos a ver desde las técnicas más tradicionales hasta las últimas innovaciones en estos campos. Eh, los invitamos, por supuesto, a aprovechar cada minuto de este congreso y a abrirse a nuevas ideas y, y perspectivas. Así que una vez más, sean todas y todos bienvenidos a, a nuestro segundo congreso de Héroes del Mantenimiento y que comience ya las jornadas de, de aprendizaje y conexión. Y para ello vamos a comenzar desde ya con nuestra primera actividad del congreso, donde vamos a conversar con dos invitados muy especiales. Dos invitados que son expertos en el área de lubricación, de análisis de aceite, de tribología y en general del mantenimiento y la gestión de activos físicos. Uno de ellos es Jim Fitch. Jim tiene más de 30 años de experiencia en lubricación, análisis de aceite, tribología e investigaciones de fallas. Creo que muchos de los que estamos acá éramos niños o algunos no habían nacido cuando ya Jim estaba dando sus primeros pasos. Jim tiene eh, un grado de Ingeniería Industrial y Sistemas del Instituto Tecnológico de Georgia y también un máster en Administración de Empresas de la Universidad de Tulsa. Jim es CEO y uno de los fundadores de Noria Corporation. Y durante su carrera, eh, Jim, una carrera bastante fructífera, Jim ha impartido cientos de cursos, ha publicado más de 200 artículos, documentos, publicaciones técnicas. Jim ha representado a Estados Unidos como delegado en el grupo de trabajo de tribología y análisis de aceites de la ISO y ha sido galardonado con numerosas patentes. Y desde el año 2002, Jim también ha sido director y miembro de la Junta Internacional de Council for Machinery Lubrication, que sería algo como el Consejo Internacional para la Lubricación de Maquinaria. Y también se encuentra con nosotros un gran conocido, seguramente conocido por la gran mayoría de ustedes, Gerardo Trujillo, Gerardo es experto también en las áreas de lubricación, análisis de lubricantes, gestión de activos, monitoreo de condición y, y estrategias de mantenimiento y confiabilidad. Gerardo es eh, presidente y fundador de la, de la Asociación Mexicana de Profesionales de Gestión de Activos, AMGA, y también presidente de, de Copiman. Y Gerardo va a estar conmigo hoy en una especie de copresentador, ayudándome a exprimir lo más que podamos a, a Jim para sacar hasta la última gota de sus conocimientos. Esta entrevista va a ser realizada en inglés, pero vamos a tener abajo los subtítulos disponibles para que todos lo podamos entender. Así que sin más, eh, comencemos. So, Jim, Gerardo, uh, thank you very much for being with us today. It's a great, great pleasure to have you all. Uh, um, in, in this first part, you know, the questions uh, are for Jim. Uh, the, the objective is to help us uh, to uh, get to know him uh, better and later we're going to ask more technical questions mm -hmm. and Gerardo will join us to, to answer them. So first, Jim, uh, thanks, thanks again for, for being here. Uh, 
could you start by introducing yourself and giving us a brief overview of your background? Okay. Uh, first of all, it's uh, it's a pleasure to participate in your Congresso, an honor to to, to be uh, involved in in this event, and congratulations to uh, you, Chris and Fractal, for uh, making this uh, this happen. Um, yes, I'm I'm talking to you today from uh, from Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is dead center in the United States. That Oklahoma, if you don't know where it's at, it sits right above Texas and. Uh, and I'm in Tulsa, which is uh, the second largest city uh, there. Uh, so uh, I heard a little bit of uh, my background given by you. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so I don't want to repeat too much of that. But I have been in this field a very long time. Uh, and I uh, perhaps you could say back uh, to my youth when I worked uh, on the farm uh, for my grandfather, uh, helping him uh, take care of uh, his machinery, farm tractors and combines and so forth. Uh, but I also uh, got a lot of experience and introduction to the field of tribology and lubrication oil analysis, uh, working in my father's laboratory. He was a university professor and I kind of cut my teeth there, uh, working around machinery and testing. Um, and uh, he was a great mentor to me and kind of gave me some early exposure to it. I went on to uh, Georgia Tech and got an engineering degree, uh, Monsanto Chemical Company after that, worked very large uh, uh, plant there, very uh, gave, me, gave me experience to the plant environment, machinery and equipment uh, there. Uh, and then when I was 24, I uh, started a company called Diagnetics, uh, which uh, kind of on the vision of my father related to uh, the field of oil analysis and contamination control. That company was uh, funded by venture capital, and we grew that company over a period of years uh, to in the area of oil analysis instruments. We had an oil analysis laboratory, uh, provided uh, filter testing uh, equipment uh, on and on. And that company was sold to uh, uh, to Rockwell Automation in 97, and I started uh, Noria Corporation in 98. So Noria Corporation is a services company related to the collection and dissemination of knowledge and information as it relates to tribology, lubrication, oil analysis, contamination control. We publish a couple of magazines. Uh, we have a big annual conference, do a lot of consulting, have a, a, a couple large uh, platforms um, with where we kind of park all this knowledge and information. And uh, we do a lot of training. We've trained over 100,000 people around the world. And that still is, uh, kind of a core uh, line of revenue for us. So uh, that's kind of my background. I'm still at it. I was Noria's uh, first employee and I'm still uh, still involved. I've got a couple of sons involved in the business. And uh, Gerardo, I've known since the early 90s when uh, he was helping us during the Diagnetics days. And he's been with us uh, all the way uh, uh, representing Noria Latin America. and. Uh, We've seen a lot of change and uh, look forward to uh, what's uh, what's ahead. Cool. Well, that's fascinating, Jim. Who or, or, or what has been you know, the most significant influence on your career path? <laughs> well, I mentioned my father. I mean, I have to give a lot of credit to him as a mentor. Uh, but he, he was academic. Uh, he wrote a lot of books and did lots of research. He had a lot of ideas. I definitely have to, to mention that. But, you know, I'm also an entrepreneur and, and, uh, and I have been since I was 24. So I, I've, I've had other, particularly people that were, were formerly on my board of directors that, uh, ran large publicly traded companies uh, that, that uh, kind of saw me as a, a, a uh, you know, an aspiring, uh, you know, in business. And uh, I'll, there's a lot of people I, I look up to still today. So. Well, um, 
I'm curious, of all the specialties, you know, within, within maintenance, why did you choose to focus on lubrication, oil analysis, or tribology? Yeah, well, I think, uh, I think lubrication, tribology, and oil analysis chose me more than me choosing, choosing it. So I was, uh, <laughs> I was wanting to start a business, I, and so I needed uh, a, a field to do that, uh, products, services, things like that. And, uh, and so my father had this crystal ball of what he thought the future of oil analysis would look like. He had some seed capital, some money that he was willing to invest in that. And so it was, it was irresistible. I, I lunched at the opportunity. I had a lot to learn and, and still learning today. I mean, it's just, there's so much has, has happened over that period of time. So we're talking about, you know, 1981 uh, you know, through to today. And, and so that's how I got into it. There was opportunity, that unmet opportunity to change the field. Uh, you know, lubrication is an extremely old field. It goes back to, you know, to the days of the, when the wheel uh, was invented, you know, the chariots and carts, uh, the Noria, which is believed to be about a, a thousand years old, you know, had to be lubricated. Uh, there's a lot of Norias throughout the country of Spain. I've, I've seen a few of them, uh, uh, such as the one in uh, Cordoba and uh, Toledo, uh, beautiful Norias there. Uh, you know, th those are very old, uh, you know, uh, Norias. They had to be lubricated. And so this is an old field, but there's a lot of new things that's happened. And there's a lot of new things, merging technologies that are coming onto the market that large uh, uh, asset owners that have critical equipment that that need uh, lubrication done correctly and need to take advantage of the technologies and the know-how that's out there. I mean, industry runs on a film of oil, whether it's a small object or a large object. If it moves, there's a lubricant. And so that lubricant has everything to do with the life expectancy of that machine. And so we've learned a few things over the last several decades, and we need to take advantage of that. And Nori and other companies out there that are in this same space are part of this transformation. Jim, I'm, I'm going to uh, ask a question here. The first time I heard about proactive maintenance, it was in the early 90s uh, when I went to a seminar in, uh, in Houston many, many years ago by the Diagnetics days. Uh, how do you, be, how, how was that you start thinking about proactive and defining the strategy uh, of how lubrication can be the most proactive tool that we can implement in reliability? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good good question, Gerardo. And I, it's, if there's, you know, there's two or three things that I feel particularly proud to be involved with uh, and proactive maintenance, the concept of proactive maintenance is one of those things. And so when I, when I first kind of had that uh, seed of an idea, and that was, I'm guessing, about 80, 1988 or something like that, you know, no one, you know, we'd, everybody knew what preventive maintenance was, they knew what predictive maintenance, but what I was thinking about didn't relate to really either. Uh, and and so we needed, a, it's like oil analysis. It's a, it's, we refer to oil analysis as a, a, a iron triangle or something. There's three main areas of oil analysis. But back then there was really just two. Uh, it's like a two-legged stool. We needed the third leg. So one of those legs was the aging characteristic of the oil, knowing when the oil is, needs to be changed, that sort of thing. The other was the machine using the oil to determine the health of the machine. It's darn hard for a machine to be in a failure mode without the oil knowing about it. So let's look at the oil. And so we were doing those two things, but we weren't ev evaluating and understanding the root causes, the third thing, the third category of oil analysis. And, and so predictive maintenance looks at how much life is left on the machine, the remaining useful life. Uh, there. And, and, and we needed something to focus on what influences the life. It's like cholesterol or blood pressure or diet and, and health or and, 
and exercise and so forth. Those are root causes uh, that influence our life expectancy. What are the root causes that influence the machine's life expectancy and how can we address that? So we needed a, a name that was distinct and proactive was, it was just the opposite of reactive. We, we don't want to do maintenance just in time, which is more predictive. We want to be way ahead of the failure curve there and change the, the, the influencing factors that will decide how long a machine will live. So that's, you know, today, if you did a Google search on proactive maintenance, you're going to see probably over a million references to citations. Uh, so we can see that, you know, that has been embraced by those that are in this field and realize that predictive maintenance is one thing, proactive maintenance is another. That's great, Jim. Um, I'd love to hear more about it, more, more about your experience, you know. So which project or situation involving, I don't know, lubrication analysis or proactive maintenance or tribology, whatever, has been the most challenging for you? Or, or maybe your most significant achievement in, in, <laughs> in your career and your, or in this field? Yeah, I was, I was just talking to my son Bennett about this recently. And, uh, you know, back uh, in the 1980s, about 80, 88 or something like that, I had an opportunity to work for uh, NASA on the space shuttle program because I had a lot of experience in contamination control and particular servo valve failures. And the, the space shuttle was at the, at the time was grounded due to servo valve failure. And they needed someone to uh, take a, a leadership role on, on solving the problem. Uh, they weren't gonna be able to launch the space shuttle again until they, they had the problem solved. And so I was hired to work for NASA over a three or four month period of time. And we ran a lot of tests on the on the hydraulics, flight control hydraulics, and uh, and so forth, and it was a challenge. There was it was a lot of pressure. They needed an answer quick. Uh, we didn't, and and so that kind of gave me a uh, an opportunity to, in a sense, make my uh, name known as a uh, someone knowledgeable in what these invisible particles are and the damage they can do to machinery. Uh, and, and, and from, that was my first big failure investigation, uh, case, you know, you know, since then we've done hundreds of them and failure is a great teacher. You learn from failure. Uh, and, it, and I've, and I've always decided if you have an opportunity to study failure and get to a root cause, don't, you know, don't, uh, let that opportunity go to waste, take advantage of it. And so, you know, at the time I was a young man and NASA said they needed help. I was a little afraid to, to you know, I, I felt in a sense like I was an imposter, uh, you know, not really the expert they might have thought I was. But I learned quickly and I, you know, and I, and I did make a dif difference and we did solve the problem. And it was related to these small contaminants. Uh, you know, since then, you know, if I mention, uh, you know, Having been involved, you know, in a, a space shuttle uh, failure investigation, it gets people's attention. It's a way to kind of garner some level of, of credibility. There's a lot of I've been involved in a lot of big cases like that, difficult cases. And I still do that today. That's my main job at Noria Corporation is to run failure investigations. We've got several of them going on uh, today. A lot of court cases uh uh, expert witnessing sort of thing, and they're all learning opportunities. I'm going to uh, to have a couple of questions here. Uh, one is uh, regarding to the future of uh, lubrication and oil analysis. What do you envision of that? And the other was uh, the other one is about education. What is the role of education at this time, and how do you envision that in the future? Yeah, so the education thing is obviously is something that Nori is is closely associated with. And, you know, back in the diagnetics days, we did a, a course, a public course on oil analysis. And I think it was the very first course in the world on oil analysis. Uh, and it quickly filled up with students and we did one after another, after another. And and we're still still doing that today uh, at, uh, at Noria. 
And, and so if there's any one thing that has been an influencing factor on change, transformation and lubrication and oil analysis, it's been education training uh, because it enables uh, things to happen. It wakes people up. They are aware of opportunities. They're not taking advantages and empowers them to do things that they didn't uh, know that they needed to do. Uh, and so we, uh, you know, we try to have that level of influence uh, there. And it's, it's a, a responsibility, a teacher, a professor, whatever uh, instructor, you know, has is trying to to uh, make a difference out there. We, we want to teach things that people need and, and want to take advantage of. Uh, so, you know, the, if there's, it's not a technology uh, that and there's a lot of new technology that's emerged onto the market that has had influence in oil analysis and lubricants. It's not a technology. Uh, it's, it's, it's know-how, it's the dissemination of know-how to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people so where they can take this knowledge into their plant, make changes, make a difference there. So that's the, the training. I'm trying to remember what your other question related to your first question, Gerardo. It was about the future of uh, the future, yeah. The yeah. The, the, the industry 4.0, how it yeah, so. will be in change. So and that's maybe I cannot, uh, in, in, in that regard, uh, Jim, uh, a question is Did you see, so uh, are there any emerging trends or technologies that you believe will redefine how we understand and approach lubrication? You talk about you know the knowledge and the importance of education, but maybe you think that AI maybe not as as a as a technology to replace uh, a human being, but a technology to like a tool to help yeah. a human being yeah. to to take better decisions. Yeah, so it's we're in the, in the middle of a a lot of change related to to AI and, and IoT and Industry 4.0. Uh, and basically the sensorization of industry, uh, you know, the smart factory and all that kind of, all those buzzwords that you, you hear. Uh, and of course, data analytics, predictive analytics, you know, you know a buzzword is a buzzword, uh, but, you know, the reality of those concepts uh, can take a, a, a while to, to, to evolve. And we're going through that right now. It's, it's unchangeable. It's a freight train. You know, when are we going to jump on board? Are we going to get, get on board? Are we going to jump to the side or are we going to get run over? Uh, and and so lubrication and tribology, I mean, you know, we see vibration accelerometers already being applied uh, on rotating equipment. And some of them are doing a really, really good job. There's some other sensors, ultrasound uh, sensors, definitely uh, at, uh, at temperature and thermography. But in lubrication, we are a little bit slower to bring on sensors that have the ability uh, to reliably uh, monitor properties of the oil as it relates to, say, viscosity and particle contamination, moisture, oil degradation, oxidation, wear debris. Those sensors are out there, but they're many of them are costly. They are a little bit clunky. Some of them have moving parts. Uh, some of them have problems with uh, uh, what we call lower limit of sensitivity. They, the, the problem has to be a little bit too advanced before they can pick it up. Uh, but they're still happening. And Nori is involved in those, those sensors today with our uh, sister company, Lunetta, uh, uh, who's involved in inspection technologies. And so we think today that we still have to rely heavily on the human being, the human uh, sensors, the the iometer, the ear, the the nose, the touch. Uh, we still have to be out there inspecting, but we can use tools. And if there are tools that are ready for us today that we can count on, we need to take advantage of those. And then we need to combine, you know, those that information with, you know, the other the the full universe of condition monitoring data that's available. You know, the the data lake. What is in that data lake? that we need to take advantage of. We need to pull that data forward to enable us to know more about what's going on. As smart as our brain is and you know that, that supercomputer that we have, there's only so much that we can process. 
And, uh, and so if we can use AI and other uh, uh, data analytical methods, then we should take advantage of it. So, you know, we're in the early stages of this, in my opinion. And uh, there's a lot of companies that are stakeholders like Fractal. Uh, and we're going to see some really fun stuff, uh, you know, come from this. In the meantime, we still have to hold to some of, some of the more conventional technologies and use laboratories and other methods, you know, maybe route-based uh, you know, monitoring of our equipment, that sort of thing, to uh, absolutely have a full understanding of what's happening with our machines today. I couldn't agree more, Jim. Um, how, how, how do you keep keep up, you know, with with new research and changes in, in, in lubrication <laughs> analysis? <laughs> well, the best way is to be have a good kind of network of colleagues that you uh, interface with on a regular basis. You know, we're all trying to keep up. And, you know, people like uh, yourself, Chris and Gerardo and so many other subject matter experts that are out there that are passionate about this field. And if they find out something that I'd be interested in, uh, they share that and I do that in, uh, uh, in, in return to them. So we are all trying to collect and share information. Uh, conferences are an excellent way to do this, just like this Congresso. You know, we want we want to go to these conferences. We want to listen to the heroes uh, that you are bringing into this conference. And those heroes are not necessarily academic types. They're not necessarily consultants. They're not book necessarily book authors, uh, but they are also the people that work in the plants that are day to day working in and around the machines. And we need to interrogate them uh, uh, and ask them what they've learned and how, you know, and, and so we try to bring that into our magazines and our newsletters. And we try to bring user organizations that have learned firsthand how to do a better job of maintaining equipment, uh, of, of monitoring their equipment and let them tell their, their stories and their case studies. Uh, you know, Nori has a huge library, you know, over 50,000 technical papers, over 3,000 books. You know, we like all of that, lots of, of digital information, internet, of course. We, we want to take anything that relates to our field, we want to have access to it. Uh, and, 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 and know, you know, it's not just about having knowledge in our head, but knowing where knowledge is. And if you know where to find knowledge, it's just about the same thing. And so if you're involved with a failure investigation, you need a bearing expert, you know, I want to go out to 10 bearing experts and ask them the exact same question and see what kind of answers I get. And we do this on a regular basis. So that's that's kind of how we how we learn. Oh, that's a great point. Well, I, I have a couple of questions for for both for Gerardo and Jim and um, for you know, for for those heroes of maintenance who are, who are here, you know, in this conference, looking to work in lubrication, maintenance, and tribology and analysis, what advice do you have for them? Do you have any recommended resources or courses for someone who wants to start in, in this field? Yeah, so there's a, there are a lot of great courses. Of course, Noria has many, but there's many others as well. Uh, and so you have to decide, you know, where what your specialty will be. Are you going to be a generalist or are you going to be a specialist? Uh, and there's, you know, you should learn from the best, uh, find out who those experts are, and be a mentor uh, to uh, be mentored by them. Uh, and so that's the first thing I would do, you know. And, and then I would, uh, like I said before, I would surround yourself with everything you can that relates to this field. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of study to become an expert, to be good at what you do. You don't have to be a, an expert expert, but you have to be have uh, a, the know-how to make good decisions at the plant level and be prepared uh, to reach out to other experts as needed to help you make those decisions uh, there. These could be consultants, they could be instructors, book authors, or just what you can find on the internet uh, there. But, uh, you know, it's, you know, learning and, and expertise, it's, you know, it's, it, it takes a lot of time. You know, somebody said it takes 10,000 hours of study. I think it, in my opinion, it does take at least 10,000 hours of study 
to have a, a high level of expertise. Uh, so that sounds like an, 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 an rather intimidating undertaking to have to study that many hours, but you know, time goes on. And some, at some point you wake up one morning and you say, Hey, you know, I think I understand this subject pretty darn well. Um, you know, I have a, a strong command of, you know, of what's going on there. Uh, and, but you have to start, you know, it's like, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. It's little by little, you know, you, you're, you're building a cathedral one block at a time. And so that's, that's what I'd recommend is to begin the process and, uh, and, and eventually you'll get to that point. Yeah. Jim, I, I know that you have many passions in the lubrication field, but one of them is inspections. I know that you are writing a big book about that. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, so I've written a book called Inspection 2.0. It's in development right now. It's been layout mode. It's and it's you know it's it's a, a visual book. It's full of images. You know, obviously an inspection you would expect it to be. It's already over 700 pages. Uh, it covers lots of subjects, uh, not just lubrication subjects, uh, but it 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 inter it allows you to use other technologies, other methods, other inspection and condition monitoring methods to aid you in making decisions related to lubrication and tribology. And so it is, it, I am very passionate about it because I believe in it because I've seen people that have the ability uh, in old timers of our field uh, who could take their hands, not with a vibra, a, 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 you know, a, a vibration tool, like an accelerometer, but their hands and rub their hands around a bearing or a gearbox and, and their hands tell them what's going on there. Uh, the way they can look at machines and the information that they can gather. You don't just inspect by glancing at a machine. Yeah, it's there. It's running. It looks okay. But you examine it. You look at it in detail. You delve into it. You study it. And if you need inspection tools, you take advantage of those. Uh, and, you know, a lot of there's operators out there. They're walking around machine every day. They do their rounds. Uh, and usually they're just glancing at machines. I've seen them. Uh, and and so when we do these failure investigations, the machine has failed, the plant's down, we were tearing the machine apart, and we start seeing, you know, how did we get to this point? Very often we got to this point through a series of stages, and many of the problems that were in the early stages, the root cause stages, were very visible uh, by the, an inspector, but they didn't pay attention or they didn't have the skills or understanding of that. Uh, and so I, I like to tell the story, you know, when I was, uh, when my son Bennett was a, a Cub Scout, he was like, you know, seven or eight years old, we went to a nature park and, and all these Cub Scouts, it was a night hike through this nature park and there was this nature guide that was helping us and we were told that we were not allowed to carry flashlights and we were supposed to tune into the, the forest uh, with our senses. And she taught us how to smell things and how to touch things and, and all the little sounds that were out there and the little gl glimmers of light here and there. Uh, and, and, and I was just totally amazed at how tuned in she was. And I realized at that point, that's the sort of ability that an inspector and an operator needs to have as they're walking around machines there. And it's it's training, it's skill based, and there's there's a great opportunity still there today, and that's what this book was. The focus and purpose of this book is to make people aware that you may be calling yourself an inspector, but you're probably only taking advantage uh, of about 10% of the information that that machine is trying to tell us. That machine is talking to us. It's a big exoskeleton. You know, how do we know what's going on? on the inside of that machine that as we're standing on the outside of the machine. There's ways to do that. So Regine, Gerardo, any, anything you want to add in, in terms of, you know, uh, if, if someone is looking, you know, to, to, to work in this field, what advice do you have? I, I just, you ask uh, Jim who was his mentor. And I can tell you that my mentor was Jim Fitch. Uh, I wanted to learn from the best. And I went there. 
uh, uh, many years ago, and then I found something that I really believe that can change the way that the industry applies lubric lubricants and lubrication. Uh, I understand perfect the concept of the of the proactive maintenance, and I apply that to my life. Uh, last year, you asked me about uh, my recovery from the COVID, and I told you that it was because that I learned the philosophy of the proactive maintenance. I don't want to be just waiting for the machine to be broke, but uh, looking at the root causes, looking at the the cholesterol and the and the weight and the how to exercise yourself because that is the way that you prevent the failures to camp. Uh, this is one of the best learnings from my life. When I came back from that seminar, I, I remember that uh, that book was in my briefcase many years because everywhere, every every place I went, uh, I, I was trying to show how easy is to become uh, lubrication excellence at the industry because that is not difficult. It is just a little uh, steps one by one in a very right way and you can be an expert uh, applying lubrication excellence. That is uh, one of the things that I, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, Jim knows because I have told him uh, many times uh, about this, uh, but um, I really uh, want to thank for the opportunity to to meet him and to continue to be uh, under his uh, mentorship uh, for all these years. Well, it's an honor to hear you say that, uh, Gerardo, and, and it, I've heard you say it before. I, uh, it, it gives me a lot of pride to, to have it come from someone like yourself who in your career, you have uh, made a fantastic name for yourself, and you've made huge contributions to the to the field of lubrication, well analysis, and tribology. So you're not just a follower of my uh, philosophies, but you've contributed to uh, the the overall vision uh, of what still needs to be done and what's still ahead uh, there. And uh, you know we're 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 part of the same uh, team. You know you're helping us in the, the in this in Spanish world, and I'm uh, trying to do it in Eng in English land and elsewhere around the world. And it takes a, a team. It takes uh, uh, you know a partners in the effort and to kind of help us understand you know what we need to be doing and and uh, today and what we need to be doing tomorrow. Uh, I, th I think. Nori is perhaps most well known, and this is a proactive maintenance concept, uh, but, but well known as it relates to contamination control. And in one of the, there's one slide that is in all of our trainings that it, people tend to want to uh, comment on and utilize after the trainings, and that's what we call our life extension table. And uh, Gerardo knows what it is. And and this is work that originated with my father in his laboratory. And he discovered that you can put these invisible particles in oil and run bearings and gears and you know, pumps and things like that. And the number of particles or the concentration of particles in the oil had, had a huge impact on the life of these components. And he'd run these components to the end of life at all different concentrations of particles. And these are particles that are indeed invisible, too small to see, too low in concentration to see. Definitely you can't feel them, but they're there. And, and people in industry do not realize that, you know, that how important that is. And since then, we have been able to help organizations uh, change their contamination control strategy, completely change their filtration strategy and their particle monitoring strategy to enable bearings to last 5, 10, 20, 100 times longer, pumps to last 10, 20, 100 times longer by understanding how particles and other contaminants influence that life expectancy. It's a real benefit. It's easy to measure. You can do it in the laboratory. You can prove it in the field. That one thing has had a huge impact uh, out there, and it, it's it's still going on today. There's a lot of organizations that still have not uh, embraced the importance of contamination control. Well, that's great, Jim. Gerardo, unfortunately, we are running out of time. So is there anything else you'd like to, to share with our audience? Uh, just... 
again, thanks for the opportunity, Chris and uh, uh, Fractal, uh, Fractal, and uh, hope you guys have a great conference. And uh, I, uh, I hope to, you know, if, if anybody would like to uh, to uh, come to our conference, we have Reliable Plant Conference coming up in Chicago the first week of June 19 or 2024. Uh, we'd love to have you there. And uh, I'll be there. And so uh, thank you very much. Gerardo. A los héroes de mantenimiento, un abrazo muy grande. A esos que se enfrentan todos los días, les envío un fuerte abrazo y esperemos vernos pronto por ahí. Well, Jim, Gerardo, thanks so much for, for your insights today. It's been a great, great pleasure for me. Uh, uh, and I believe for the audience to learning from your experience. Y gracias también a todos los participantes. Eh, los invitamos a que continúen en sintonía de las actividades que tenemos planeadas a continuación durante el día de hoy y el día de mañana. Así que quédense en sintonía y nos vemos en breve.